And I, today I have the honor to welcome you very warmly on behalf of the organizers and hosts, the two e-commerce uh, national committees of Germany and of Israel and the Berlin Chamber of Architects. And I welcome the visitors here in the Alvin Brandes Auditorium of the Metal Workers Building uh, from uh, Erich Mendelssohn. And I warmly greet all the participants from all over the world who have joined us online outside the screens. It was it's one year ago when Regina Stefan, Ita Heinze Greenberg, Inbal Ben Gittler, Helge Pitz, Eran Mordohovic, we met for a kind of Israeli German online birthday party for Erich Mendelssohn. And we got chatting about the Erich Mendelssohn worldwide legacy. And we had no idea what developments the next 12 months would bring. We did not anticipate the widespread interest and enthusiastic response to our idea of establishing an Erich Mendelssohn Initiative Circle encompassing both West and East. And we certainly did not foresee Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine, violating international law, the rising number of victims and destructions caused by this invasion and aggression. Erich Mendelssohn witnessed and suffered through two world wars. And in view of the terrible images and reports from Ukraine, some of us feel today as if we are on the eve of a third world war. Our thoughts and hearts are with the people in Ukraine and with those expelled from Ukraine. And I would like to ask you to rise from your seats for a minute of silence in memory of the victims of this ongoing war, please. Thank you very much. After World War II, the renowned Jewish-German philosopher Theodor Adorno claimed to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric. He said it in 1949, and two years later it was published. And many an art and memorial event in Germany has to be asked itself in the recent weeks whether it is not ignorant to address questions of monument culture in other places confronted with death, with injuries, with displacement, with devastation in Ukraine. And we, we want to set a mark against war and tyranny with this Erich Mendelssohn conference in Germany and with the upcoming conference in Israel. We understand this assembly, which is attended by experts from all eight countries where the architectural heritage and legacy of Erich Mendelssohn is preserved, we understand it as a contribution to peace work and to cooperation in the spirit of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and for mutual understanding. On the occasion of the Leipzig Book Fair last weekend, the Ukrainian author, Serishi uh, Sharadan wrote, Books cannot end war, and he continued, but during war, books can help you to stay yourself, not to lose yourself, not to perish. And even monuments and memorials cannot end war, but they can help you to get through it better. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to leave now the floor to the three organizers and hosts of this conference, please join me in welcoming Teresa Keilhacker, the president of the Berlin Chamber of Architects. She is in a sense the local host of this meeting today and tomorrow, as well as Eran Mordohovic and Tino Mager, the president of e-commerce Germany and uh, 
Israel, who have jointly adopted this cooperative partnership. So, Isaac Kaila Hagel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Haspel, and welcome, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm very proud that we can host this event today. Um, we, as uh, I'm representing the Chamber of Architects in Berlin, uh, we are only tenants here in the house on the second floor, and tomorrow morning you will uh, have a guided tour there to have a look at it. But um, welcome to ICOMOS Germany Israel, Tino Maga and Eran Mordorovic, President of ICOMOS Germany and ICOMOS Israel, and welcome to Christoph Rauhut and Moritz Wullen, um, Christoph Rauhut as a State Conservative Berlin, Con Conservator Berlin, and Moritz Wullen uh, for the Staatliche Museen zu Berlin. We had a very interesting exhibition yesterday at the Kunstbibliothek. It was really great that you had this pop-up exhibition for us. Thank you very much for that. And welcome to our special guest and long-term UNESCO ambassador of Germany, Dr. Michael Wobbs. We are very pleased that we can hold this event, which is really intense. You had already a guided tour yesterday to Luckenwalde, and I know you have um, you had exhausting days uh, um, behind you and ahead of you, but I hope it will entertain you to such an extent that you are happy that you came. And um, the background of the conference, I think, will be told to you later. But um, may I introduce the Chamber of Architects to you. Um, it's containing almost 10,000 architects, and most of them are, um, cons uh, um, some of them are landscape architects, city planners, and interior designers, but, but most of them are architects. And of course, uh, lots of them are uh, very, uh, knowledgeable of heritage buildings and know how to cultivate them. But as you also well know, Berlin is a very poor city and state, and therefore we are always confronted with money problems. We have lots of investors who run Berlin, and uh, they are not always interested in this cultural heritage we are having here. And therefore, it's always a big challenge to combine the cultural goals with the execution of and preservation of buildings which are important to us. But uh, therefore, we are very happy that um, in this case of the Mendelssohn building, it is a very lucky history and it has been refurbished. And you also probably have seen this little flyer, which is uh, telling the story about it. And there are some drawings exhibited in the hall when you enter the building. And um, IG Metall is a very good owner of this building and looks after the building. Uh, not everything is original, like these, these interiors are not, but the, the shape of the building in itself is in, in great condition. So, and we are on the second fl floor, as I mentioned. Uh, I think you will have a very good overview from here uh, and get lots of interesting lectures today. I'm uh, glad that I can now introduce you to the two presidents. I don't know who is first. I think the German one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so come here. It's yours. and have a very inspiring conference. <laughs> Good morning, dear guests, speakers, partners, and organizers here at the Metal Workers Building and in the digital distance. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of e-commerce Germany to this special event on the exciting architectural work of Eric Mendelssohn. It is gratifying to see so many of you here in person. This is something we have missed very much, and I hope that we can continue to meet in this way in the future. 
with physical presence and face-to-face -face conversations and exchanges during the breaks and after the official program, which is very essential part of conferences as we have learned not least in the last two years. And we are grateful to be able to meet here in a building largely created by Mendelssohn. It really adds to a first-hand experience. And we would like to thank the Berlin Chamber of Architects for their close cooperation, the Rüstenroth uh, Stiftung for their support, and especially Ecomos Israel as a partner of this conference. And Aaron Modovic and I actually considered having a joint welcome, but we just found out it's more practical to speak one after another. Back to the building. This former house of the German Metals Workers Union was partly destroyed, as you just heard, and renovated over time, but it is in a very mint condition and has many original details. So when you're here in these rooms, uh, you can more or less come into direct contact with Mendelssohn architecture. And that's a reminder that this is not true for the overall work. It was not long ago that the Schocken Villa in Jerusalem was threatened with destruction and others like the Red Banner textile factory in St. Petersburg almost fell victim to neglect. It is not only for this reason that there's an urgent need for professional conversation about Eric Mendelssohn and the significance of his contribution to 20th century architecture here in and around Berlin, but also in Israel, England, or the United States. The name of these places stand for his far-reaching connections and influences, but also for his flight and work in exile, a topic that unfortunately continues to define the lives of many and is currently coming very close again and becoming ever more serious. These mentions are not intended to detract from the importance and influence of the architecture itself, but to make us aware of how topical these aspects of Mendelssohn's work are and what we are actually dealing with. The program of the following two days offers many links that go beyond the idea of Eric Mendelssohn as a star architect whose work is still missing on the World Heritage List. It will allow us to reflect on Mendelssohn's architecture as the result of circumstances that were extraordinary but affected many, as the result of processes that included a multitude of influences and also many partners and people who were involved in the conception, design and realization of the buildings in question. And an extraordinary woman, his companion Louise Mendelssohn, without whom the work and our idea of Eric Mendelssohn would not exist as it does. Lectures on his spirituality, his work and his life in exile, as well as reflections on how he fits into the history of architecture, will encourage us to further complete the overall picture of the phenomenon Eric Mendelssohn, and help us to carefully assess how outstanding and universal this heritage is. I look forward to this interdisciplinary and international conversation, and I wish you two wonderfully inspiring days of um, enriching insights and joyful discussion. Again, um, welcome and thank you all for being with us. So, good morning, everybody. As Tino has said before uh, in the beginning, uh, we have chosen to uh, to join forces and uh, make a, a kind of a specific pre uh, opening and greetings in the name of Ecomos Germany in Israel. So first, I join all the um, the greetings and the thanks for all the organizer and the hosts of this uh, conference. And uh, I will uh, present a case study uh, very shortly because it's not a part of the conference, but to illustrate why Ecomos Israel is so uh, concerned and uh, concentrated and uh, uh, seeing in this initiative uh, a crucial uh, tool to 
protect uh, heritage and Mend Erich Mendelssohn heritage in specific. Um, so when we have the presentation. Okay. So I will I will show it in a, in a, another opportunity. Uh, when we will find a, a so I wanted to present you the case of uh, as Tino had mentioned also the Shocking House in uh, in Jerusalem. That was uh, uh, first introduced to me by uh, my teacher, Dr. Ita Heinze Greenberg, who is here. And uh, she, she was actually the first uh, who introduced me to the work here, Erich Mendelssohn, while I was an architecture student in the Technion in Haifa. And in um, uh, 2003, the building was actually was about to be demolished uh, by a private inv investor wanted to build a, a housing project and the, all the plans and the protection uh, laws uh, of Jerusalem and of Israel could not uh, actually be effective in this case. So a public campaign started together with the Council for a conservation of uh, heritage sites in Israel, ECOMOS members and other very concerned architects and historians. And this project was uh, finally, uh, was not realized. And due to this campaign, but also due to the fact that it's just stand near the house of the Prime Minister of Israel, and there were many difficulties to realize a, a housing project in such a proximity uh, out of security reasons. So this building is not demolished. On the other hand, there are so many plans to remodel it and have addition on it, which actually uh, it brought us in this with this, this initiative to say, although it's a very important a, a very significant and a, a, a model building uh, of Erich Mendelssohn. Unfortunately, it would not be able to be part of a World Heritage uh, nomination due to lack of authenticity and uh, actually uh, without any access to the public. So with this example, I wanted to uh, emphasize why ECOMOS Israel uh, and other uh, uh, organizations in Israel see the importance of such initiative and finally creating an extra layer of protection for uh, for this heritage when local laws and, uh, um, and decision makers cannot take this decision. We hope that, that the international uh, umbrella and, uh, and, and framework of the World Heritage Convention will help to protect the very wide and uh, rich heritage of Israel. And we have actually those days some cases on the table that needs uh, uh, this, this kind of extra layer of protection. And I hope the initiative and the processes that we started here will be quick enough to avoid and to, uh, to have an uh, effect on the fate of those uh, wonderful buildings that Erich Mendelssohn uh, and his clients actually left us uh, in Israel and all over the world. So my last slide was to say a successful conference for everybody, for the organizers, for the lecturers, for the listeners. And uh, for us, uh, I wish big success in this marathon, uh, which we started a year ago. And I don't know when it will be ended, but I'm sure we will win. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Erich Mendelssohn Initiative Circle, I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Kailaker and the, the, the Chamber of Architects, as well as the presidents, and especially Eran, for sharing your expectations on this initiative to save and to 
to, to protect uh, buildings and the heritage of Erich Melnson, not only in Israel, but also in Russia and in other uh, countries. And I would specially include in these things many partners from Germany and from Israel and from other countries who have supported us and representative of all of them. I would like to name the Wüstenroth Foundation and its director, Philipp Kurz, without whose unbureaucratic help and support this meeting would not have been possible so quickly one year after the initial, uh, the initial meeting. The heritage of Erich Mendelssohn includes not only the built heritage, not only the architectural heritage, but also the drawn, the designed, uh, and the written legacy. He has handed down to us so to speak, an architectural as well as a documentary cultural heritage. And UNESCO has set up the two programs, programs for both, the famous World Heritage Program of the Convention of 1972, whose 50th anniversary we are celebrating this year, as well as the Memory of the World, the Documentary Heritage Program adopted in 1992. And I welcome the two secretaries of the UNESCO commissions from Israel, Dalit Atrakshi, and from Germany, Roman Lukscheiter. Let us watch the video message from Bonn and let us listen to the video audio greetings from Jerusalem as UNESCO welcome addresses now. Dear friends and partners from ICOMOS Germany and Israel, Dear colleague Dalit Atrakshi, dear Mrs. Miller and dear Mrs. Kyle Hacker, dear conference speakers and participants, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the German National Commission for UNESCO. To build peace in the minds of men and women through cooperation in education, science and culture, the founding idea of UNESCO has once again been threatened by the terrible war going on right now in the Ukraine. Even more so, it is important to unite, to work together and to engage in solidarity to keep the principles that UNESCO is built upon alive. We are convinced that multilateralism, with the United Nations as its core, remains the only way to achieve global peace, security and prosperity. I am convinced that demonstrating the strength of our partnerships and showing an unprecedented level of multilateral cooperation, especially in terms of safeguarding our cultural heritage and identities, is an important answer to those who break with international law and put peace, democracy and freedom on risk. I am particularly pleased to, to, to join you today. This event not only pays tribute to Mendelssohn's extensive oeuvre, but also gives us the opportunity to continue our cooperation with ECOMOS Germany. And it is a great chance to build on our intensive decades-long collaboration with the Israeli Netcom. A look back on the friendship between the German and the Israeli National Commissions shows we share a particularly long and intensive history of cooperation in the field of UNESCO-associated schools, human rights education and peace education. Our cooperation goes back to the 1960s, when first contacts between German and Israeli UNESCO-associated schools were established. We are all global citizens was another project in which schools from Germany and Israeli took part recently. Today, we came together to honor the impressive heritage of Mendelssohn, a brilliant architect who left his footprints on three continents. Mendelssohn thus was a cosmopolitan, a global citizen par excellence. Furthermore, he was not only a pioneer in modern architecture who inspired his contemporaries and successors with his long curved facades all over the world, he also was a lover of music and art and a talented photographer. Therefore, this conference itself is a great example of multilateral and transdisciplinary cooperation. And not only brings together excellent researchers from all over the world, but includes also stakeholders from outside academia. I thank everyone who made it possible for this meeting to take place. Dear Mr. Marga and Mr. Haspel from ECOMOS Germany, I am pleased that we have extended our cooperation agreement to work together as partners. The UNESCO family, with its vivid networks all over the world, are our greatest treasures in these challenging times. Today, the Mendelssohn Symposium is an excellent opportunity to discuss the outstanding value of this particular transnational heritage. For the next two days, I wish you a fruitful and inspiring meeting. 
Good day, good afternoon, perhaps good evening. I'm Mary Miller, Director of the Getty Research Institute, or GRI, and I'm so happy to welcome you as you gather to assess the work and legacy of Eric Mendelssohn, even though I cannot be with you in person today. Over the past two years, we've devoted ourselves to many distinct projects, but among those projects are ones that engage many of our collections as we seek to understand the history of the acquisitions we have made over the past 30 years. We continue to build depth and breadth in the history of architecture and no more so than in the history of architecture in Southern California from the case study house projects of the immediate post-World War II period to the architectural models of Frank Gehry for Disney Hall. We live via Zoom more in the world than ever, even as this pandemic begins to wane. We seek to live in this world with awareness of where we are and to acknowledge the power of the visual to bring understanding of the past into our present and future. Today in Southern California, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabriel Ligno Tongva peoples. I'm particularly happy to appear in this short Zoom of welcome, and for many reasons. In the early 1990s, the GRI received a large gift of key Mendelssohn materials, almost entirely from his California period, when his San Francisco office became the center of his practice after the Second World War. Our holdings include original architectural drawings in pencil and color pastels, correspondence, photographs, and the layout project for a publication of sketches, books, and journals, mostly related to his practice in the United States. When we first acquired these materials, the GRI became the only significant repository of Mendelssohn's work in North America. The purchase about five years ago of Mendelssohn works comprises further original architectural material, also mostly related to the designer's practice in the United States. With the acquisition of these additional documents, the GRI remains the only repository of Mendelssohn's work in the United States, and in fact, for all of North America. I'm grateful for this conference, for the work you're all doing. The GRI is fully in favor of the Mendelssohn Initiative for the serial nomination of a relevant group of his buildings to the World Heritage List. And we wish to highlight the fact that the archival collections will represent the only robust and significant deposit and repository of his design thinking. Thank you and have a great symposium. Thank you very much, Mary Miller. This was her greeting from the Getty Research Institute, the director. Uh, we had a different uh, agenda or schedule here on the plan on the program and the technique. That is why we had now this uh, greeting from, uh, from LA uh, directly here, because the partners, this is the Art Library as well as the Getty Research Institute, they are very important for our whole issue because there are the, 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 the documents, there are the letters, there are the drawings, there are the sketches, and we are very uh, grateful for the support we receive from uh, Moritz Wullen and uh, the Art Library as well as from the Getty Foundation. Moritz Wullen will later present uh, the work of the Art Library and of the Prussian Heritage Foundation and Stella Kashatu, who is with us, will represent the Getty Institute. So now I have the pleasure to announce Dalit Atrakshi, the Secretary General of uh, Israel, who will speak to us online. Yes, thank you. Dear friends and colleagues, first I would like to congratulate you for this important conference about Eric Mendelssohn's work, which is taking place right now, and to apologize for not being able to join you. It is very important that in, in this uh, very interesting times, this conference is being taken face to face. And um, it is important that the results of this conference will be followed 
by our good work together. Now, I would like to say a few words about Eric Mendelssohn and its work. Uh, though Eric Mendelssohn worked and lived in Israel, Palestine then, only for a few years from 1936 to 1940, he had influenced the architectural culture for the following decades. His work and sensitivity to the regional and vernacular uh, was in many ways ahead in a whole generation. Um, his biography, as uh, we know it, for, uh, symbolizes in many terms the history of the Jewish people in the first part of the 20th century, and which took him to many countries, among, amongst them Israel, resulted in an international collective of varied, varied and iconic designs. Uh, it is a remarkable collection, and we are proud that an important share of it is located in our country. There are 12 buildings designed by Mendelssohn in Israel. Most of them became iconic in uh, Israeli architecture and urban scapes. Mendelssohn has worked and um, social relation with prominent figures in the Zionist movement as well as the British Mandate government. Those dual relations were quite unique, uh, as was, sorry, uh, as was his architecture. And this is also a part of the uh, unbuilt heritage associated with Mendelssohn's story. His story, the building he designed, and his clients reflect in many ways the story of the forming of the state of Israel. And for this reason, we see the importance of elaborating his heritage. Some of the 12 buildings were radically alerted and lost their context or were rather deformed. Others are still intact and still represent the design and technological innovation to typical, so typical to his work around the globe. We hope that with this initiative uh, of the international and local Israeli recognition in his masterpiece and contribution of Eric Mandelson to the world modern culture will grow and result in better protection of those masterpieces. On behalf of the Israeli National Commission for UNESCO, I wish you all a very fruitful and elaborative conference and wish to thank you very much for the opportunity to bring Mendelssohn's work to the floor of discussions of world heritage. Thank you and enjoy your time together. So I, I thank all the speeches very much for the online audio and video messages we received today from, from Bonn, from Los Angeles and from Jerusalem. And I'm, I'm glad that now we can come back to the audience here and to those who are present uh, in Berlin in the Chamber of Architects. The title of our event is Positioning. Erich Mendelssohn and the Built Heritage of 20th Century. And I'm very pleased that Regina Stefan, the long-standing Mendelssohn expert from Darmstadt at Mainz University, one of the founding mothers of this initiative, of our World Heritage Initiative, and so to speak, the head or one of the head and souls of this two-part conference series in Berlin and Haifa, that she has accepted to personally introduce the topic and to conclude this welcoming block with uh, introductory remarks uh, Regina, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Berlin. I'm very glad that we meet in person. This was a long discussion, and we finally decided to, to dare to do so. So I welcome you, uh, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. Among the modernist heroes listed in every encyclopedia of the 20th century, world architecture, Erich Mendelssohn is one of the most important and internationally most influential. Yet his name and work are missing on the UNESCO World Heritage List. With the Einstein Tower in Potsdam, Mendelssohn set an early signal for expressionist modernism 
a monument for Einstein's theory of relativity. In the Weimar Republic, with his boldly curved buildings and dynamic building masses, he was one of the pioneers of streamlined architecture. His outstanding reputation led to commissions and invitations to lecture in many countries in Europe, Palestine, and the United States in the 20s. 1933 was a turnaround. All of a sudden, he had to leave his native country, Germany, where he had celebrated greatest successes and where he ran the largest architectural office. It was located in the Columbus House, which he himself had built shortly before on the Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, the busiest square in Berlin and thus in Germany. He developed an extremely ingenious building design for it. On the 31st March 1933, 12 years of commuting between countries and offices started from Berlin to Amsterdam to London, and from there, since 1934, back and forth to Jerusalem. In both cities, he set up offices, which he needed to cope with the flood of orders he received. In Britain, he was celebrated by the RIBA. In the British Mandate of Palestine, he received the largest commissions. When the German troops under Generalleutnant Erwin Rommel in 1941 approached Palestine, he left and, after an adventurous journey around Cape of Good Hope, not to take the Atlantic route, lasting several weeks, reached New York in the spring of 1941, where he again was very much welcomed by his fellow architects. Yet his arrival in the United States was late. It was too late. To gain a professorship like Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Hilbers Eimer, and others. Of the monument of the modern monument, move, sorry, modern movement. His solo exhibition at the modern Museum of Modern Art in New York, intended as a great prelude to the new phase of life and work in the United States, had to close prematurely due to the United States entry into the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Years of great material restrictions followed. Unlike uh, it was not until 1945 that he was able to build again, and he did not have much time left. Unlike his earlier work in Europe and Palestine, he had to shift towards synagogues and community centers, for which he had to undertake an unbelievable number of journeys through the huge country, which also exhausted him. His early death in 1953 at the age of only 66, prevented him from building on earlier successes to the same extent. Unlike his fellow emigre, uh, emigres Gropius and Mies, his colleagues in the 1920s in Germany, he refused to set foot on German foot, uh, soil again until Germany faced up to its guilt over the Jews. After his death, he was almost forgotten in Germany, or was he deliberately disowned? Was he a thorn in the German side? What is striking is that it was Italians who published the first studies on Mendelssohn in, nine, in 1953. Maria Federico Rogero wrote the first attempt at classification under the title Il Contributo di Mendelssohn alla Evoluzione dell'Architettura Moderna. Mendelssohn's Contribution to the Evolution of Modern Architecture, followed by a few small publications culminating in Bruno Zevi's tremendous book, Opera Completa, in 1970, again in Italian. More Italian books were dedicated to Mendelssohn by Zevi, David Palterer, and Cesare Stevan. In Germany, his former employee, the Dorian of 20th century German architectural history, first exhibition of his work in the Berlin Academy of Arts in 1968. He was the one who repeatedly pointed out Mendelssohn's importance without, however, being able to achieve a broad effect. It was the acquisition of the Mendelssohn estate by the Kunstbibliothek, the Art Library in Berlin, in 1975 generously given back to Berlin by Mendelssohn's widow Louise, 
that, were, that opened up completely new possibilities to, for research, and it took off accordingly. With Ita Heinze Greenberg, Hans Rudolf Morgenthaler, Kathleen James Chakraborty, Thilo Richter, Renate Palmer, Anne Grünberg, and myself, several PhD students dedicated themselves to Mendelssohn's work from the 1980s onward. In 1987, the Art Library showed an exhibition of his sketches curated by Sigrid Achenbach. In the same year, Louise Mendelssohn papers were bought by the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. The exhibition uh, Erich Mendelssohn, Dynamics and Function, which I had the privilege of curating on behalf of IFA, the Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations, toured with its beautiful models built by my students from the University of Stuttgart from 2000 over 12 years and spread his work beyond the borders of Europe to over 30 presentation venues, among them in 2004 as a um, remark, as a birthday present, of, oh no, 50 years of his death, it's not really a birthday present, so uh, 50 years after his death, uh, in the Berlin Academy of Arts. Since 2000, several books followed, finally also in America. The 2014 the Art Library in Berlin and the uh, uh, Getty Research Institute published the Erich and Louise Mendelssohn correspondence online. Just this year, the newest book by Michele Stavagna and Carsten Krohn came on the market. And yet, while there are meters of books on the shelves about the other heroes of modernism, Mendelssohn must first be given the place he deserves. Firstly, because his architectural designs are the alternative to the placeless designs of international style that made all the cities of the world look the same. Secondly, because he was a truly international working and thinking architect, a philosopher and politically extremely critical spirit. These were the basic findings when Jörg Haspel and I launched the presentations of his work as a kind of test balloon first in February 2021 at the Deutsches Architekturmuseum in Frankfurt am Main, as part of the event Context, Contrast, Continuity, Built Heritage on Modern Metropolises, and then at ICOMOS Germany's International Heritage Day in April 2021. The very positive response convinced us that we would find strong support for the, our attempt to place Mendelssohn's heritage at the center of a transnational initiative. Here, hereafter, we approached the relative, relevant experts, the representatives of ICOMOS, UNESCO, and monument authorities in the eight countries where Mendelssohn's buildings are located today. Germany, Poland, Russia, Norway, the Czech Republic, the United Kingdom, Israel, and the United States. I'm too small. As well, as the international community of Mendelssohn scholars. Thank you. The response has been overwhelming. The group now includes almost 40 experts from all over the world. It is a truly transnational circle of scholars and experts pursuing a common goal in a friendly and extremely collegial atmosphere. The foundation, the discussions about the possible candidates for nomination and the OUV, the Outstanding Universal Value, the call for papers and the planning of the symposium have been extremely dynamic and only developed exclusively digitally to date. It's the first time that we all meet in person. The fact that we are meeting here today has to do with the enormous digitalization boost from the corona pandemic, at least one positive side effect. But also with the courage of the circle, of mem circle members and chamber of architects in Berlin-Brandenburg to plan a face-to-face -face meeting and hold it in a hybrid form. Our Erich Mendelssohn Initiative Circle, founded only a few months ago, aims to explore the universal role of Erich Mendelssohn's architectural work in the history of modernism and to assess its potential for World Heritage nomination. Our focus is on the more than 40 surviving uh, buildings by Mendelssohn. In all the buildings, 
in eight different countries, climates, landscapes, and existing environments, Mendelssohn's authorship is unmistakable. He has succeeded in realizing buildings that are distinguished by the following characteristics. The functional dynamics that he had already formulated as a goal in the early 20s, curved lines, aureoles, and balconies, but applied not as an arbitrarily placed accessoire, but, as, but with a clear functional and or urbanistically relevant uh, reference. The precise adaption to location and climate view and vista. The innovation and high precision of the construction. The refinement of the details, and we can see it in this house. The buildings are rooted to the place where they were erected. This marks a tremendous difference to other architects of the modern movement whose buildings are placeless. Even though he, since 1933, li lived the life of a nomad that was constantly on the move, his buildings respond to where they are. Many questions are still to be answered and we are hoping for answers through the symposium. What is the OUV of Mendelssohn's work? That is, what distinguishes his architecture above all others and in comparison to them? Is it modernity, migration, spirituality? Or a global architect in dialogue with sites and places around the world? Which UNESCO criteria best depicted? Which buildings are in a state of conservation that allows nomination according to the strict criteria of authenticity and integrity? What role does his Jewishness play and music? Who will ultimately combine the transnational efforts and carry out the application? We have received well over 40 abstracts of, on our call for papers that can help us answer these questions. We could not fit them all into the two Berlin days, but we have passed them to our dear colleagues from Israel, who have started planning the second part of the symposium at the Technion in Haifa in November. In Haifa, we will also discuss the question of whether Mendelssohn's drawings, writings, lectures, models, and photography of the Mendelssohn archives in Berlin, in the Art Library, and in the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles should be nominated simultaneously for UNESCO's Memory of the World program established in 1992. We believe that in hardly any other architect's legacy, there is such a strong connection and overlap between the different works of art. The memory of the world's impetus, and I quote from the UNESCO program, the impetus came originally from a growing awareness of the parlous state of preservation of and access to documentary heritage in various parts of the world. War and social upheaval, as well as severe lack of resources, have worsened pro problems which have existed for centuries, end of quote. We are currently experiencing very painfully that in the 21st century, the danger of cultural heritage suffering irretrievable losses through war has not diminished. By digitizing the correspondence between Erich and Louise Mendelssohn and parts of his estate of drawings, the two archives in Berlin and LA have already taken the first important steps. Further steps are to follow in order to make Mendelssohn's significant contribution to the design and history of architecture accessible to everyone worldwide. You see, we are only at the beginning. There is still a lot of work to do. It's my heart's desire that we continue to do this in this wonderful atmosphere of transnational collegiality and friendship. I would like to conclude with sincere thanks to all the colleagues from EMI, Erich Mendelssohn Initiative, how we shorten it, from EMI, who have pushed the proceedings so hard with us. It's a real pleasure to work with all of you. And in fact, 
It's one of the miracles of the corona pandemic that we were able to put this together in just a couple of months. Special thanks to Eran Modohovic, president of Ecomos Israel, and Inbal Ben Asher Gitler, who cannot join us, unfortunately, in presence, who have been very active with us in moving the project forward. I thank the, mem uh, the collaborators of Ecomos Berlin for all their work in preparing the uh, symposium. Many thanks to the Chamber of Architects in Berlin, our generous hosts in this beautiful 92-year-old Mendelssohn building. It doesn't feel like being so old, doesn't it? Already in, is, in this single building, Mendelssohn's architecture proves to be timeless, but not placeless. To the contrary, it fits perfect on this plot of land and its original purpose. Doesn't play the bay window, the, the, the bay window behind the screen, doesn't the bay window look like a flag bearer at the forehead of a union demonstration? I'm now looking forward very much to the lectures and discussions of our symposium here in Berlin, but also in the web. I hope that there will be also questions from the web. Thank you very much indeed for your attention, for your coming to Berlin, your listening somewhere in the world, and your precious support. Thank you. Professor Stefan, thank you very much for this, what we call inductory remarks. I think it was a fantastic and excellent introduction in the whole uh, topic which we are discussing now here. And I never thought that it would be possible to have this kind of report introducing in the whole situation and in our project. Thank you very much. I have to uh, announce that we have a list of, for the participants tomorrow. Tomorrow we will have a guided tour or we will have two guided tours through the uh, Metal Workers Union building here by Erich Mendelssohn at nine o'clock, an English one and a German one. And please uh, register or inscribe in the, in the list which are, is at the desk at, at the entrance. Uh, the opening of our conference is dedicated to the UNESCO World Heritage uh, programs and to the options as well as to the requirements of a multinational cooperation. And I'm very glad that we could convince uh, Katarzyna Piotrowska from Poland for the moderation of this initial uh, session. She is a graduated landscape architect and has been internationally experienced in the field of World Heritage nominations and World Heritage management for many years. And now I have the pleasure to passing the microphone and the floor to Mrs. Piotrowska. The floor is yours. I, may I invite you? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my great honor to, to be here. And I am the lucky one who took part in the yesterday trip, which was really fantastic. It was my first introduction to uh, Erich Mendelssohn uh, heritage. As uh, uh, World Heritage Convention is an international uh, agreement aimed at uh, heritage protection, uh, it's also an excellent tool for international cooperation. It was in the past uh, very important and it uh, shows to be uh, as important or even more important in the future, having in mind what's going on in the world. Uh, with the attempt uh, to protect Erich Mendelssohn's legacy and help the world to know his importance, World Heritage Listing and Memory of the World program uh, seems to be the right tools. Uh, to do so, uh, acquaintance with the World Heritage philosophy and requirements for inscription uh, and, uh, uh, are crucial. Uh, that's what we will look uh, at during uh, the first session, which uh, we just uh, start. Uh, talking about heritage, a uh, question of values and authenticity, um, pops up very frequently, even during the introductory speeches to today. Uh, referring to NARA document of authenticity, all judgment about values uh, 
a connect uh, all judgment about uh, values attributed to cultural heritage uh, properties is uh, are connected to the cre credibility of re related uh, information sources. Uh, so we see what we know, we know what we see and learn. So knowledge about Eric Mendelssohn is crucial. Uh, that's what we uh, will do during uh, this uh, seminar. We will start uh, with looking at the documentary heritage of the architect. Uh, and then we will follow with, um, uh, with more insight into, into his uh, achievements and what, uh, what, what, is, what is left. I was kindly asked not to speak for too long, and I kindly <laughs> accepted this uh, request. So with no further ado, uh, let me in, uh, invite our first speaker, uh, Birgitta uh, Rindbeck, with the presentation. Uh, I need some help to read the title. <laughs> Uh, transnational nominations, uh, mapping of attributes and values conveying the outstanding universal value of the nominated property. Uh, Birgitta Rindbeck uh, graduated of History of Art, Archaeology and Ethnology in Münster, Rom and Bonn. Uh, she, she has long-standing experience in the, in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention being uh, the head of the World Heritage Coordinating Body in the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. She was the cultural expert in the German delegation to the World Heritage Committee during Germany mandate, and that was the time when we both met many times during many uh, international but also national meetings. Uh, she is member of Council of ICROM, German Commission for UNESCO, German World Heritage Foundation, ICOMOS uh, ICOM. She lectures on World Heritage and World Heritage Management. She also publishes on architecture, history, monument conservation, and the World Heritage Convention. Birgitta, the floor is yours. Uh, please mind the time limits. We have 20 minutes for presentations and just uh, Let's, yeah, please come. Uh, just one uh, organizational information. After presentations, we won't have time for discussions. We'll have time for discussions after the four presentations in, in this session. So keep what, you, what comes to your mind, put it down or remember, and then we'll have a discussion at the end. Keep reflecting. Katarina, thank you very much for your kind words and the introduction. So, and to all the others, good morning. I'm glad to be here and to see you all in person. It is indeed, I think, my first uh, meeting, non-virtual or digital meeting since months. So therefore, thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, Germany, I hesitate to announce that, but we have 51 Okay, 51 World Heritage uh, sites in, Ger in Germany. Uh, but I'm proud we have uh, uh, among this 51 World Heritage sites are 10 international serial sites. And uh, I think we, Germany is a country with the most shares in international serial nominations. We started in 2004 with a uh, common site with uh, our colleagues from Poland, that is the Muskawa Park. That is not a zero transnational information because it is a single site, but uh, on the, uh, right on the border to, uh, between Germany and Poland. That means we have uh, World Heritage sites with all of our nine, not with all, except one, with eight of our nine direct neighbors. We have um, shares in World Heritage Sites with state parties to the convention of 12 members of the Council of Europe. And we have three World Heritage Sites that are transcontinental, that means with chair, we, we have sites in, in uh, common sites with Argentina, for instance, and Japan. You see it. So that is, I think, that 
caused a lot of work, and uh, but the, the international cooperation and multilateralism is on the heart of the convention, and therefore this international serial side they they represent how we could uh, work together and what. Uh, the, the convention likes to see, and that is indeed uh, the international cooperation and, uh, and the international sites are really best practice examples, and it is very important that we have this international cooperation even after the inscription on the World Heritage Sites and uh, site uh, list, and that is what the convention and the committee wants to see. Just a few, I will uh, give some maps. You see uh, on the left hand that is uh, the site in Germany, it's a natural site, the beach forest, which uh, has more than nearly 20 states parties to the convention. On the other hand, you see another, uh, you see a cultural site that is the uh, frontiers of the Roman Empire, which is uh, separated in different segments. And uh, we have another uh, natural site that is a button sea. It's, it's, it's a serial site as well uh, in the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark. And on the other hand, you see the prehistoric pile dwellings around the Alps, uh, which I think eight countries uh, involved. On the other, on, on the left side, you see the map of our youngest World Heritage Site. No, not, not that. There's another one with the Czech Republic. It's the Erzgebirge Kushnori mountain region. It's an industrial site. And on the left hand, you see the great path of Europe, uh, the great towns path, uh, the spa towns of Europe inscribed in last year with um, 11 component parts in seven countries. And I think that is um, the most interesting site for you and for your topic because it is the architectural work of Le Corbusier, an outstanding contribution to the modern movement. This um, nomination process for the site lasted more than 10 years and it's quite interesting and I will come back to it, how it developed and what did it mean to bring forward such a nomination or a trans transcontinental nomination? Um, serial sites are, or you will find information on serial sites in the World Heritage uh, Guidelines, the guidelines for the implementation of the World uh, Heritage Lich, which are regularly updated. And I marked in red, I think, the most important provisions of these guidelines for serial nomination in B, um, that, is, uh, that uh, wants the state parties that, of course, all the state parties should uh, be clear that, and that they, have, that they have a consent to nominate uh, such a property. Sometimes that's, that is difficult because we saw it last year that one of the nominating state parties of the, of the uh, Danube Limes uh, withdraw their, uh, the component part of their country in the very last minute, which caused a lot of problems. Uh, sorry, I need your help because <laughs> um, the, 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 okay, the um, next um, important provision is uh, that wherever it possible nomination dossiers uh, should be um, should be prepared uh, and submitted by state parties jointly in conformity with Article uh, 11 3 of the Convention because that is really uh, crucial because if some state parties uh, came into the uh, um, process at a later stage, this uh, cost of this cost often problems. So, and the next one is each component, that is quite important, each component part should contribute to the outstanding universal value of the property um, as a rule in a substantial scientific, readily defined and uh, discernible way and may include inter alia intangible attributes as well. 
The next one, which is really important for the nomination process consistently and in order to avoid an excessive fragmentation of the component parts, the process of the nomination of the property, including the selection of the component parts, should take fully into account the overall manageability and coherence of the nominated property. You have to organize the, uh, right from the start and you have to, to, to ask yourself, is such a... Transcontinental international serial nomination, it is, it is possible to manage this one because it is, it's crucial for the time after inscription, but I think it is also crucial for the process itself. For me, um, the research is needed f to prepare a good uh, nomination dossier, but I think the elaborating of a nomination dossier is just a handicraft and therefore it is it is quite formalized by UNESCO and you need to fulfill some some things which is which are uh, are expected from formal expected from the World Heritage Center and the last important uh, uh, provision in the guidelines is the state parties consent shall establish a joint management committee or similar body uh, to oversee the management of the whole of nominated serial transnational property. And as I mentioned, it's you need such a body just uh, from the beginning because otherwise you are not able to uh, to prepare this nomination dossier and it should be in this committee should be involved not only uh, the scientific and the research colleagues, you should just from the beginning involve also the administrative uh, level on the state party uh, side because it, in, in the end the state party is the body uh, which submit or the state parties which submit the nomination dossier, it is not, it is not the sides which submit the nomination dossiers. Yeah, okay. So um, the World Heritage Convention is a site-based convention and of course a lot of monuments are inscribed which are linked with the name of an architect, but only four sites are inscribed, inscribed bearing the title or the name of the architect in the title. For instance, the Bauhaus in Germany and uh, the, the Bauhaus and its sites in Germany, um, in, in Weimar, Dessau and Bernau, very close connected to the work with uh, Walter Gropius and Hans Meyer. They do not, uh, in, in the title you will not find the name, name of the pro most prominent architect and the founder of the Bauhaus. There are, at the moment, there are only four uh, sites, World Heritage sites, bearing the name of an architect. That are the works of uh, Antonio Gaudi in Spain, the first one in 1984. Then in two, the year 2000, the major townhouses of the architect of Victor Horta in Brussels. And I just mentioned is uh, the architectural work of Le Corbusier, uh, outstanding and outstanding contribution of the modern movement. And the last one was in 2019, the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. So that are the only four World Heritage sites bearing the name of the architect in the title of, of, of the um, inscribed site. During, especially during the uh, nomination process of Le Corbusier, which took us took uh, took us more than uh, ten years, it became clear that Ecommerce International and the Scientific World Heritage Panel of International uh, of, of World Heritage. Um, uh, of uh, committee, World Heritage Panel of uh, Ecomos International, refused to inscribe the complete oeuvre of an architect on the World Heritage List. It's quite clear why, because uh, it should be of outstanding universal value and it should be masterpiece, a masterpiece and it should not be the complete oeuvre of one architect. In the in the process in the nomination process of Le Corbusier, the list of component parts was uh, reduced from more than twenty five um, 
architectural works of Le Corbusier to 17. And that was the most, yeah, challenging part of the nom of, of, of elaborating the nomination dossier. And during this, this process, I think it is better to go to the, uh, well, yeah. And uh, during this process, a table was involved, which was more or used, I think, uh, sometimes I said it, it was a handicraft sheet, how to to, uh, to create a, a, an, an OVOV. And you see this format, I will come back it, uh, in more detail uh, in a later stage. But uh, it was a, for the first time that uh, each of the component parts was listed and you see uh, in the head of this table um, attributes were dedicated to each of the criteria. And then if you go in detail to this uh, table, you will see that not every attribute, which that means every component part of the nomination uh, contribute to the to, to every criteria uh, attribute of, of the and value of the um, of the OUV, but they have a special role uh, to fulfill, and that was made clear. And in the end, we convinced ICMOS International with this table that the selected parts of the oeuvre of, of Le Corbusier uh, have a sub made, make a substantial contribution to the outstanding universal value. The next one, I think. Um, what are attributes? So I think it is up to now. The attributes are not uh, defined in the operational guidelines. You will find an, uh, up, to, up to now a definition in the uh, periodic reporting third cycle. And we have to, in, in the coming months, we have to define what uh, are the uh, attributes of our already inscribed World Heritage Sites in, in the upcoming months. And I'll just cite its attributes can be physical qualities or fabric or the relationship between them. Attributes can also process impacting on physical qualities such as natural or agricultural processes, such as arrangements or cultural practices have shaped distinctive landscapes. So the next one. <laughs> Uh, and now I think it has become yeah, normal to start with, uh, with the uh, mapping of attributes uh, just at the beginning of a nomination process. We did that, for instance, uh, the last time for the great spa towns of Europe. And there we had the same problems that we have to reduce the nomination from originally more than 25 spa towns in Europe up to 11. So, and this mapping of attributes attributes was a very helpful tool to come to this result. Uh, the, I, I will not uh, cite it, but it is quite clear the purpose of make, the, mapping the attributes is drafting the SOUV as a mission statement for the application process, elaborating a successful nomination dossier, um, and uh, managing a property through indicating what is needed to be maintained in order to sustain the OUV, elaborating a management plan, and conducted heritage impact assessment uh, after the inscription. So the next um, slide, please. Yes, and now you see uh, you have a better view on the um, on the table, which which was uh, yeah elaborated during the nomination process of of um, Le, Le Over of Co Le Corbusier. You see in the top of of the table um, the criteria, which were. Uh, which were used for justifying the outstanding universal value of Le Corbusier. It was uh, two and six. And uh, I have to add, this is, this is the original table which uh, was uh, submitted to the World Heritage Center and to ICIMUS with, with a nomination dossier, but uh, the 
World Heritage Committee uh, decided to add criterion one as well, that one is a masterpiece. And normally, if you are speaking about a, uh, the work of an architect, I think you have to present, of course, a masterpiece. Therefore, we did not understand during the nomination process why ICOMOS International recommended not to um, refer to criterion one that's masterpiece. Therefore, we were very much um, delighted when the World Heritage Committee decided in 2016 to, to uh, add this criterion as well. And the table is, as I mentioned, it, you have on, on the head of the table, you have the criteria, you have the attributes uh, and values. And on the left side of the table, you have the co component parts. And it is marked what uh, to which attribute this sing the single component parts add to the uh, common or UV of, of the side. If, and, and you see the second part, uh, the, the, the second side of, of this table as well. So it is, uh, I think the table has five or six uh, sides. I will not show you every side, but, uh, um, but I think um, you can imagine how it works. And such a table is quite important. Um, you can adapt this table, for instance, for the international comparative analysis as well, because if you change uh, the left column and put fill in all the comparative, um, the, the comparable uh, sites outside the work of, of um, Mendelssohn, you can compare them, the values and attributes, you can pair, compare them and you, you can show how what, what makes the over of all the um, selected sites of Mendelssohn unique in comparison with other, other World Heritage sites. And if you uh, go further, you can, for instance, after the inscription, um, take the mapping of, uh, use the mapping of attributes for conducting a heritage impact assessment. Uh, this result, of course, is the, outs uh, the, defin uh, the definition of the outstanding universal value, and really you have to justify that for each and every component part. You cannot say, okay, we put all the works of, uh, of Erich Mendelssohn in the nomination dossier. You have to justify the OUV for each single component part. And in the end, you have to formulate a common OUV. And that is the threshold which you have to address. So the next one. A short that uh, is the content of the OUV brief synthesis, justification of criteria, statement of integrity, statement of authenticity, requirements for protection and management. I just mentioned at the beginning that the manageability of the site is crucial right from the beginning as well. And the next slide. Uh, state parties concerned shall establish a joint management committee or similar body to oversee the management of the whole of a nominated serial transnational property. I just mentioned that uh, a nomination process yeah, is more or less a handicraft process, and it is quite crucial, and I show on the, on the right side the uh, structure for the management of the great spa towns which were inscribed in last year. And just from the beginning, they had a strict structure and uh, clear responsibilities. Who is responsible for what and who is organizing what and who is paying? Because that in the end is crucial as well. If you have uh, a nomination process, which yeah, you need 10, five years, um, five to 10 years for a process normal, no, normally, then you have really a strict organization with uh, clear competences and tasks for each level of, of the stakeholders involved, on the level of the stakeholders involved. 
Okay, I have the last uh, nomination, uh, the last slide. So on the right side, you find the, on the webpage of the World Heritage Center, you will find all the manuals, guidelines, which are needed for the elaboration of a nomination dossier. But I put on the left side a, a, a small booklet, which was uh, conducted by the Tokyo National Research Institute for Cultural Properties la, uh, last year. It is attributes a way of understanding OUV, and you will find inside a lot of um, definitions and proposals how to deal for me, it is a quite new instrument of mapping of OUVs, and I, I do not know where you can find this book in the internet, but I think it's difficult. But uh, if you have a, 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 a nomination, a nomination uh, address, I think for your for your initiative, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share the uh, digital version of this booklet with you. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Birgitta, for your very uh, hands-on experience in uh, nomination process and uh, pre pre preparing the sites and also the, the documentation. Uh, I guess many people have many questions. Uh, please keep them uh, to the end of the of the session. And may, not, may I now um, invite our uh, next speaker, Bogusław Szmekin, with a presentation titled UNESCO Transnational Serial World Heritage Nominations, Roles, Advantages, Challenges. Uh, Bogusław Szmykin is a professor at Lublin University of Technology, Dean of Civil Engineering and Architecture Faculty there. He is the president of ECOMOS Poland and the general secretary of ECOMOS International Scientific Committee of Technology and Philosophy of Conservation. Professor specializes in protection and conservation of architectural monuments, revitalization of historic towns. He also has very long ex standing experience in the world heritage issues. Uh, professor publishes a lot. He's an author of uh, much over 100 articles and several books on protection and conservation of heritage. Uh, professor, we are in your good hands. The floor is yours. There is a limit of 20 minutes for the presentation. Please remember. Dear colleagues, uh, frankly speaking, this conference uh, should be treated as, as a stage of discussion on the preparation or ability of preparation of serial nomination on the World Heritage, Heritage list, list, and such a goal of conference requires answer to a simple question. Does legacy of Mendelssohn, our world, and can be inscribed on the World Heritage List. Of course, I will not answer this question completely, but I will try to present elements of these answers. And in this con con context, I will present the UNESCO serial nominations. And let me start with the easier question, benefits of inscription on the World Heritage List. And based on my experience, I can state that it is worth to inscribe monument on the World Heritage List. And the positive effects of inscription can be analyzed on three levels. Country, it means state party, heritage protection system, and site inscribed on the World Heritage List. At each of these levels, the benefits are different. However, for that conference, the level of individual site is important. Therefore, I will try to enumerate the profits resulting from inscription on the World Heritage List because it seems to me that is important for us on that state of preparation. So the first element that because of need of inscription, we have to do, do detailed analysis of the site and use methodology of the World Heritage System 
which in my opinion is the most advised, advanced in the heritage protection. The second element, we should treat together all elements of functioning of the place. It means preservation, management, and the use. The third argument, we should introduce a comprehensive and modern system of the management of the place. We should use a very special solution like buffer zone, heritage impact assessment, and so on and so on. And the fourth argument, we should conserve and protect the site in accordance with the very high standard which are specified in the World Heritage System. The fifth argument, thanks to that, we are in a circle of a thousand, the most valuable elements, the most important for the whole humanity. The sixth argument, we could promote our place based on that status. The sixth argument or the seventh argument, we, we, it is easier to ask for money for that place because of that status. The eighth argument, it is also easier to ask for investors. We used yesterday how important that element could be. And uh, yeah, that was very uh, important. And that, that is also very, uh, it is easier to, to ask for money for infrastructure, for invest in visitors, for the revitalization programs and so on and so on. Uh, I'm convinced about these arguments. However, if you know sites in which not all these benefits have been achieved, this is not a defect of the World Heritage System, but the managers of the particular site. In the case of serial nomination, that is even more benefits, but I will talk about at the end of my presentation. So the second question, which should be discussed, these are the potential typology of, uh, of inscription on the World Heritage List. Because the heritage resource is so huge and so diverse, it is necessary to create different typologies that would allow this, this resource to be structured and compared. It is obvious that it is not possible to compare Egyptian pyramids, rock paintings, vernacular architects, historic sites, and so on and so on. Therefore, a number of the divisions uh, have been introduced, the general purpose of, of which is to divide the heritage into groups within which it is possible to compare the values of the elements that make up them. That division may be as follows. Due to the scale and specificity of the site, it means monuments, group of buildings and sites. Due to the number of sites covered by the nomination, could be a single property or could be a serial nomination. Due to the nature of nominated sites, cultural sites, site of nature and mixed sites. By location, national, transnational and international. And due to the belonging of the site to the specific typological group of heritage. Of course, that, that could be a great number of different typologies. And based, based of above mentioned forms of site classification, um, possible form of serial nomination can be determined. It means that sites from each of the three possible groups, sites of three of possible locations, sites of three possible spatial characteristics, and sites representing every typological group of heritage. It means that serial nomination is a very, very open and universal form of inscription on the World Heritage List. And of course, it could be also used for the legacy of the Erich Mendelssohn. So the next question should be when serial nomination should be created. And according to the uh, description presented in the Article 137 of the Operational Guidelines, two basic conditions, uh, the basic condition is that at least two or more, more components should be 
collected in order to create such a nomination. And in addition, three conditions are indicated which should be met. The first condition and the first point indicates that the character of the connection between goods could be very different, no limits in practice. The second, the second condition, the second point indicates that each, each of the component, each element of the nomination should participate and represent the OUV. And the third point is, the third point indicates that all components, all elements should be consistent. It means that it should be possible to create a common management system. And on that basis, the conditions for the creation of a serial nomination can be formulated. So the form of serial nomination shall be, shall be used when the OUV is based on the group, not on a single object. The second condition, that the selection of number of objects should be result of the definition of the concept. This is a very important condition. And the third one, you know already that each object creating that serial nomination should contribute uh, in the creation of the OUV. So summing up, we can state that serial nomination, a form that could be used if we are able to describe and to characterize the historic phenomenon and it should be possible. Uh, the examples, very shortly, examples of the serial nominations still is very limited. Well, I'm saying ab about the cross-border serial nomination and transnational nomination. Among more than a thousand current nominations, only 33, these are transnational nominations, serial or, or cross-border. And in the field of culture, it is worth recalling two nominations. You know those case studies, great spa, very clearly defined phenomenon. So it was possible finally to select 11 research and to nominate them based on the criteria two and three. And the second, the second uh, example, the legacy of Le Corbusier, also finally 17 objects have been selected from seven countries on three continents, and that, that uh, nomination um, uh, was uh, included based on the criterion two and uh, six. And this example clearly shows that the subject of the serial nomination can be the selection of works of one architect. So for example, Erich Mendelssohn, so formally, this is uh, possible, possible. Specifics of serial nomination based on the documentation, the essence of a serial nomination can be presented on the basis of a template for a serial nomination. We know that that documented format for the property, properties for inclusion on the World Heritage List, example adopted for use for a serial nomination in article 130 of the operational guidelines and article 132. We know the list, we know the eight uh, points which should be completed for the documentation. And summing up again, I would like to summarize that the main assumption, assumption described in this document is that all these sites, all these sites should be presented as a one whole. This is a key and basic condition. So all these elements or these components of serial nominations should be presented together, even if they are presented in individual points. And all these elements should be documented also as the whole, if it is possible. That's, that's very important. So finally, the conclusions, the advantages and disadvantages of serial nomination, because we should also 
to say that there are, there are some disadvantages. So advantages from our point, which are very important for some heritage groups, this is the only possibility, the only option of obtaining of the word heritage status. And in my opinion, that should be the key argument in our case, because probably on the current state of development of the World Heritage List, it would be not easy to convince the international society, the only one piece of the among the um, uh, Mendelssohn legacy should be inscribed on the, on the World Heritage List. So this is a very important argument. Uh, the other argument, also important, also important, based on our yesterday excursion, that sar such form is, is of inscription is optimal form of demonstrating of OUV and also for the creating of the program of the protection. And also, it is very important, based on my own experience, that thanks to that form of inscription, we are able to create a network of cooperation between those sites. And our today's meeting, this is the also a proof of that, that because, because of the networking, we are able to, to achieve uh, additional value. And that should be only the starting point. We could we are able to create a synergy of such cooperation, but there are also some disadvantages. We should understand that creating serial nomination from different countries, from different pro pro protection system, different standards and possibilities of the pro pro property management, were in a bit complicated situation. So this is not easy to, to create such a common unit, such a common entity. So that's that's important argument in practice. And of course, in terms of time, uh, optimistic, optimistically, I, I wrote here that we need four or five years. I don't know, starting from that year or starting from when you started, I don't know. Yes, this is uh, must be. We should know that that should be a long standing process. And this is not a failure, objectively, that would be a long standing process, but very fruitful for the protection, for the management of the sites, which could be potentially inscribed in the World Heritage List. Thanks for your attendance. And thanks for. Professor, very much we, with your overview of the, of the World Heritage uh, System in case of the uh, uh, serial, serial nomination. It's not an easy task in front of uh, AMI, and uh, I, I do um, uh, also uh, think that the process is the most important. It's challenging, but it's the most important and, uh, and very uh, useful for, for, for the protection of, uh, of heritage and uh, then the, the management. Uh, with the overview of the, of the World Heritage System, I also want to say that I'm quite long in it and I'm still learning how to swim. It's not an easy, easy field to, to go uh, with the nomination to, to the success. It has a lot of challenges uh, in, um, in the process, but uh, with a group of such dedicated people that, that uh, I think will be uh, quite good experience, a very good experience. And after looking at the World Heritage, now we are going to look at the documentary uh, legacy of uh, Eric, uh, uh, Eric Mendelssohn. And uh, our next speaker is al uh, already uh, with us, with the presentation, uh, Moritz Wullen, uh, with a presentation titled The Mendelssohn System. Uh, Moritz Wollen is the director of the Kunstbibliothek der Stadtlichen Museen zu Berlin, Art Library, uh, Art Library National Museums uh, Berlin, uh, which is home to the Mendelssohn Estate since 1975. 
In cooperation with the Getty Research Institute, uh, uh, he and Regina Stefan created a single digital window on the extensive Mendelssohn papers held in Berlin and Los Angeles. As a director of the Kunstbibliothek, um, uh, Mr. Wollen manages a network of interdisciplinary research and digitization projects on the history of architecture, design, fashion, photography, and media. He is curator of exhibitions with a focus on the history of arts, science, and ideas, among them Mythos Babylon 2008, The Arts of Enlightenment 2012, The Piranesi uh, Principle 2021. The floor is yours, director. <laughs> Very nice. Great. Um, usually I prefer to extemporize, but because my English is not so good, I prefer to read it from the paper. Um, in the very um, beginning, um, I want to thank you, our colleague from Russia, Sergei Gorbatenko. Um, yesterday evening, he um, made a small gift to the art library. Um, the gift is a drawing of a landscape with architecture, not by Erich Mendelssohn, made by a German soldier in 1943. Um, you cannot read the signature. Um, you cannot reconstruct um, who the designer was. And um, when I saw this drawing in um, this situation in which we are, I was very moved because in this moment I was not able to say, did this um, soldier survive the very day on which he did this drawing? And um, somehow I asked myself, oh, or I said to myself, um, unknown man, I think, War was not your business, and I think um, war is not man's business at all. So thank you very much for this very, very moving gift. Um, in the next um, 15 minutes, I want to give you an idea what um, the art library may contribute to this initiative. Um, first, I would like to give you um, a short introduction into our institution, um, not for vanity, but maybe the art library will be an important player in this project, and so it's good to know what is the art library. So first, I will give you a short introduction. Um, secondly, I will give you um, a short introduction into our Mendelssohn collection. And then I will try to share some ideas with you concerning the potential of this collection for your initiative. Let's begin. Oh, where do I? Ah, great. Ah, hello, Art Library. Um, let's begin. What's the Art Library? Um, well, the Art Library, which was founded in, 18, in 1867, is a combined infrastructure of the National Museums, consisting of a library system and museum collections. And um, the main function is to enable the National Museums to do interdisciplinary research. Interdisciplinary research on architect, fashion, photography, design, art, and media. And the first important pillar of this infrastructure is our library system. This library system consists um, of one art historian library um, at the Kulturforum. We visited it yesterday. Here you see it from the helicopter perspective. And um, we also have an archaeological library on the museum island. It looks like a prison, but it's not a prison. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a library. And um, we also um, are planning a third library for non-European art and culture um, in Berlin Dahlem, which is a district in the very south of Berlin. And together with this library system, we also have a collection system. We have collections, big collections on, um, I wrote it not to forget it, architecture, art books and media, design, fashion and photography. 
And each collection has its own curatorial management. And with these collections, we do a lot of research and digitization projects, um, only to give you one example, together with the German Film Museum and together with the Ethnological Museum, we work on the exploration of Leni Riefenstahl's photographic legacy, um, which is one of our latest acquisitions. Um, and in addition, we do up to six, six, seven medium large scale exhibitions per year. Um, we show these exhibitions um, at the Kulturforum, um, the, the location you visited yesterday or some of you I visited yesterday. Here you get a very colorful impression of one of our exhibitions in the last years. And we show the exhibitions also in the Museum for Photography. Um, the Museum for Photography um, is run by the Art Library in cooperation with the Helmut Newton Foundation. Very important because Helmut Newton also had to leave Germany in 1933. He had the same fate like Erich Mendelssohn. Um, last year, for example, we did an exhibition on um, the fashion of the punk era in uh, Berlin. We did an exhibition on Piranesi with our wonderful Piranesi collection. Um, we celebrated the, th the 300th birthday of Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Um, last year, we also did an exhibition on the function of photography in the art academies around 1900. And as if this is not enough, we are planning another exhibition platform um, in the Museum of the 20th Century, um, which is currently under destruction directly in front of our door at the Kulturforum. I think you saw the building site yesterday. It's, it's a very ugly building site, like every building site. But this will be also a very important place for us because this building which looks like a cottage um, will be a terrific showcase for all our design, fashion, photography and architecture collection and also for our Erich Mendelssohn collection. So um, Erich Mendelssohn will play a very important role in the museum of the 20th century. But let's have a closer look at our architecture collection. Um, it comprises around 50,000 objects from um, the 15th century up to the 20th century by great masters like Francesco Borromini, um, as I said, um, Giovanni Battista Piranesi, Peter Behrens, Richard Neutra. Um, and we also have wonderful um, bequests of various architects of the 20th century in our collection, Peter Behrens, Heinrich Tesseno, of course, Erich Mendelssohn, um, Josef Maria Olbrich, you see here some wonderful, colorful examples. Needless to say, say that um, our architecture collection does not include physical architecture. We don't collect castles or luxury mansions or um, skyscrapers or cathedrals. What we are interested in is architecture as a communication system, as a communication system which is based on processes, on processes of different kinds like sketching, like planning, like reflecting, debating architecture, representing architecture in visual and textual media. And of course we are aware of the fact that uh, we cannot collect and preserve this whole system of processes as a whole. Um, we can only preserve some fragments and some pieces. In some way, we are in the role of a paleontologist um, who tries to reconstruct whole ecosystems only on the basis of some scattered bones and fossils. Um, following up this, you could describe Erich Mendelssohn's, the, our, based following up on this, you could describe our Erich Mendelssohn collection 
as a material representation of the Mendelssohn system, also describing processes, processes of sketching, of reflecting, of planning, of discussing, of representing architecture. It includes around 2,700 drawings and sketchings, and in addition, letters, manuscripts, photographs, books, magazine articles, and so on. And even, some of you enjoyed it yesterday, um, three-dimensional models. Some of these models were built after the death of Erich Mendelssohn for exhibitions, but uh, many of these um, models are from Erich Mendelssohn himself. They served him as a design model um, for his projects. Um, at the left, you see the design for the Maimonides Hospital um, in San Francisco. And to the right, you see the design of the Holocaust Memorial in New York from 1951, which was never realized. It's really a miracle that this outstanding collection is in the art library in Berlin on German ground. Because you have to imagine that Erich Mendelssohn was ostracized. He was defamed. He was expelled from the Prussian Academy in 1933. And if Erich Moe Mendelssohn would not have been left Germany, he would have been killed in one of the concentration camps. And so it's really a miracle that this collection is now in Berlin. And it was the decision of Louise Mendelssohn. Um, Louise Mendelssohn decided 30 years after World War after World War II, in 1975, to give this collection back to Berlin. Not especially to the art library, because we're not so important, but to Berlin. Um, she writes, nach 42 Jahren, genau an dem Tag, an dem wir Berlin verlassen mussten, die Stadt, in der seine Laufbahn im Jahr 1918 begann, die Stadt, die er liebte und nie wieder sah, kehrte sein Werk, das untrennbar mit seiner Persönlichkeit eine Einheit bildete, nach Berlin zurück. I try to translate it. After 42 years, on the very day when we had to leave Berlin, the city in which he started his career, which he loved and never saw again, his work, which is intrinsically linked with his life, finally returns to Berlin. And this is a very important statement by Louise Mendelssohn, because um, she tells us that the Mendelssohn system not only consists of his work, it also includes his life and his fate. Um, our archival holdings on the Voga complex we visited yesterday is a good example for that, for this combination of life and work. Um, as you all know, the Voga complex was built um, between 1925 and 1931 in Charlottenburg. Yesterday we learned that this was a complex consisting of a big cinema, of uh, gastronomy, um, of a housing complex, and even of tennis courts. And um, within our collection, within our collection, this um, project forms a rhizome-like structure. This rhizome-like structure includes sketchings by Erich Mendelssohn, a lot of sketchings by Erich Mendelssohn. Um, these sketches show um, complete structural compo compositions, they show interiors, they show details of the light installation, they show showcases, and so on. And this rhizome-like structure also includes the fantastic photographs by Arthur Köster. They are artworks in its own right. And sometimes we show them in our Museum for Photography only to show the art of photography and not the art of architecture. 
And another part of this rhizome-like structure of the VUCA complex within our collection is, for example, this big model, which was built in the 80s, I think, to prepare an exhibition. To the right, our restorator, um, Imke Henningsen, and you see um, Imke Henningsen is a normal-sized man, um, woman, and it's a big, it's a very big model. And, of course, another very component of this rhizome-like structure within our collection are the letters of Erich Mendelssohn. And here you get from the work of Erich Mendelssohn to his life. Because in this letter in 1931, or from this letter, you learn that Erich Mendelssohn was not only um, the architect of the Universum Cinema, he was also a cinema enthusiast. In this letter he writes in 1931 that he was much more impressed by the film of All Quiet on the Western Front than by the book. So he loved the cinema. And uh, yes, it's important to know this and you know this only from his letter. The research and the reconstruction of this Mendelssohn system, of these rhizome-like structures combining life and work, um, represents a major challenge of the art library. And uh, much still remains to be done. A very important step was the cooperation together with the Getty Research Institute, which we started in 2012, I think, um, together with the predecessor of um, um, Maristela Casciato, um, Wim de Witt, um, here you see uh, part of the website. Um, the, the, um, the, um, the goal of the project was to digitize the letters by Erich and Louise Mendelssohn. The letters by Erich Mendelssohn um, are part of the collection of the Art Library. The letters of Louise Mendelssohn are processed by the Getty Research Institute. And the goal of this project was to link those collections together. And so now you have a wonderful digital database um, curated by the wonderful Regina Stefan, who, who, who read all the letters. And um, yes, it was, <laughs> it was a very exhausting project. I think it took us two or three years to finalize this project. And now you have this wonderful database, which um, provides a fascinating glimpse into the ideas and into the life of Erich Mendelssohn. And not also in his life, but also in the lives of other Ger German Jewish emigres in uh, England, in the British Mandate of Palestine and the USA. Um, here, there's a wonderful um, letter um, in which uh, about um, Albert Einstein. So these letters also um, give you information on the network of Erich Mendelssohn. Um, it gives you a survey on all the people um, with which, with whom he exchanged ideas, with Amédée aux enfants, with composers like Arnold Schoenberg, and so on. But as I already pointed out, um, much still remains to be done. Um, the key challenge is, I think, the intelligent linking of the visual and textual remains of the Mendelssohn system with the physical architectures. A first attempt has been made by a book which was published last year by Carsten Krohn. Hello, Carsten Krohn. He sits here in the second line and he <laughs> has raised his finger. And um, his wonderful book combines, as you see here, combines the today situation of the buildings of Erich Mendelssohn with historical photographs and documents from our collection. This is, let's say, um, a good starting point for, for further projects because our dream scenario goes much further. Um, our dream scenario is a both digital and analog infrastructure which enables researchers and ordinary people to navigate from one point to the Erich Mendelssohn system to the other. Um, for example, in this dream scenario, a physical architecture like the Voga complex um, will be or will serve as a gate 
to the architectural world heritage in a much broader sense of the world, also including his drawings, his letters, the texts, and the images. And as we just learned from the tutorial before, um, the idea of the whole is very important. Um, I think it's also very important for the success of the project to see the work of Erich Mendelssohn just in order to realize that the work of Erich Mendelssohn is, is much more than the sum of the parts. And I think this will also be a big challenge for the scientific preparation um, of the nomination to bring all these different aspects and media of the Erich Mendelssohn system together. So that's it. Uh, it's a very important um, uh, presentation speaking about the accessibility of information uh, available about Erich uh, Mendelssohn uh, legacy. And uh, I noted one thing, uh, architecture is the communication system and my uh, question, but also I think a question to, yeah, to the initiative, what Amy wants to say the world about Erich Mendelssohn. That this is something we should, uh, or, or you should answer yourself when uh, uh, preparing the nomination. Uh, let me now invite our uh, next speaker, uh, Marti Stella Casciato. I hope I pronounce your name, Professor, well. <laughs> Eric and, uh, with the presentation titled Eric and Louise Mendelssohn Papers, Germany and United States. Uh, Martistella Casciato uh, is an architect and, and architectural historian. She is a senior uh, curator and head of architecture special collections at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles since 2016. She has been responsible for major acquisitions, among them Erich Mendelssohn's projects of the American years. Previously, she was a professor for architecture at the University of, uh, University of Bologna, Italy. She taught history of architecture in many academic programs in the United States and lectured extensively in Europe and beyond. She has curated exhibitions at the Getty Research Institute, including Bauhaus, Bauhaus beginning in 2000, beginnings in 2019, her publication, uh, Rethinking Global uh, Modernism, Architectural Histori Historiography and the Postcolonial, uh, co-edited with Vikram uh, Prakash, uh, published in 2021, is on my desk wait waiting to be read. Professor, the floor is, is yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm the last speaker of this session in the morning, and I wish to, again, to begin by thanking Regina, Stefan, Jörg, yes, Haspel, and the Ecomos Berlin team for the energy they put in the organization of this symposium and for the invitation. Yesterday, we had a great day of discovers of Mendelssohn's work. In addition, as a member of the team who has collaboratively developed the, the Mendelssohn Initiative Circle, I want to thank all the colleagues with whom I had the opportunity and the pleasure to work jointly in the last year. I mean, as Gregina said, it's one of the advantage of the coronavirus. We all met regularly, and here we are in person. It's a great day. Um, a few words about the GRI, very few. You know, we use this acronym to indicate, and you'll hear more than once, the Getty Research Institute. The Getty Trust in Los Angeles manages four programs. The Getty Museum, which includes also the Getty Villa, the GCI, the Getty Conservation Institute, the Getty Foundation, and the GRI. The GRI is dedicated to advancing worldwide the knowledge of the visual art, architecture, and understanding the history of our built environment. The GRI has a research library presents and also special collection of rare materials. Holdings are on prints and drawings, photography, modern and contemporary art, 
and architecture. And uh, this idea, the GRI library and the special collection together, they serve, as we probably all know, an international community and provide a unique environment for research, for critical inquiry and scholarly exchange. I hope one time soon, when traveling will be much easier, I mean, to offer you a welcome to the GRI and the Mendelssohn Collection. So under this framework, my presentation, which is mainly visual, aims to shed light on the genesis and the evolution of Erich and Louise Mendelssohn collections. I use the plural because those collections are multiple. And uh, uh, this corpus of documents grew through diverse purchases and donations, so the two, com the two combination is relevant, in the course of approximately, now we know, 30 years from mid-80s to 2018. In my talk, I will follow the chronological progress of the growth, focusing on the role of the diverse actors that contributed to the current holdings of three Mendelssohn-related sets of archival documents. The most important I mean, component uh, of this uh, presentation is that the slides I'm showing you that I have selected are exclusive reproduction of papers and other images, photographs held in this archives. So everything doesn't need to have the name GRI because it's in Los Angeles. Let me start with the first slides. Okay, the initial corpus of documents, we heard of a, an initial corpus of documents here in Berlin, 75. Let's go on the other side, on the Pacific coast. The initial corpus of documents to be purchased dated from 85 to 93 and belong to the estate, estate of Esther Mendelssohn Joseph. Esther was Erich and Louise's uh, only child, born in Berlin in 1916 during World War I. Then Erich was away a lot, uh, fighting in the trenches, preparing sketches. We know, I mean, constantly sketching. And Louise took her baby to the Swiss countryside so that she could offer her a more peaceful environment and better food. First escape. Esther grew finding more affinities with her father, Erich, than her mother, and continued to receive his encouragement through the years. This is an important aspect to see these two women, how do they decide to locate their I mean, I mean, their estate. Um, she left Germany, Esther, earlier, probably a year earlier than her parents. She ended up marrying, divorcing, and living in London. Eventually, she rejoined her parents in San Francisco, where she remarried and resided until 2004. Esther became active in the promotion of Erich memory and legacy after Louise died. In here you see the image of the mother and the daughter. Louise died in 1980. For several years, he made attempts to reach the Kunstbibliothek, that's what I know in Berlin, where her mother Louise had placed, we heard from my colleague, correspondence, papers, drawings, models, painting by Erich, and other ephemera. Eventually, Esther decided to turn her attention to the Getty. Now, what I'm showing you here are 
the folders of the GRI central files documenting the diverse purchases through the years. This is something that usually no public gets up, I mean, uh, to see because they are considered the institutional part of the purchases. Um, the correspondence at the time when she approached uh, around 1983, the, um, the Getty, the correspondence shows that there were at least two major dealers for this uh, uh, purchase. One, you see the letter of Ex Libris in New York, and it's, this is only related to what I see here, and I don't see more, 10 drawings from the collection of another architect, German architect, Hans Schwippert, who collaborated with Erich, but for a very short time. And then on the other side, you see a dealer in Berlin, Jürgen Holstein, whose agency, in fact, had a major role because sold the whole documentation on paper to the Getty. So this is only one example of a letter. It says Eric Mendelssohn material. And I was curious reading those documents. Here it's mentioned three, a letter from a Mexican admirer, <laughs> Victoria Ocampo. And I went to the archive and I find, of course, the letter of Victoria Ocampo. It's a letter that she sent to Mendelssohn praising the, his own proper house, the house of Ruppenhorn. And this is a translation in German by Luis, if I understand well, with annotation handwritten by Erich Mendelssohn. So there are letters that cover many different aspects. And here to go back to the house, I show uh, oops, and you will understand later what it is. A quick sketch of Ruppenhorn in 1933, and then also sketches. Those belong to two different, I mean, moments in the life of Mendelssohn. And you will see very soon where the sketch on, on the, on your, um, right uh, belongs to a sketchbook where the other one, the number 19, has to do with the book with Rogero. And then uh, finally, to conclude on this acquisition, something that I was very, always very interested in, this is a collection of furniture from the house Am um, Ruppenhorn that reached through Holstein, the Getty, the GRI collection, actually I have to say the Getty collection more correctly, in 19, because it doesn't belong to the GRI, but to the Getty Trust, in 1993, a short message written by um, the curator at the time says, well, we basically collect papers, but those are important furniture. And in fact, that are not even very expensive. So let's have them. And here they are. Now, let's talk about the Eric and Louis Mendelssohn papers. That's how it's called. That is the first corpus of documents at the GRI. They comprise the personal correspondence and document of the Mendelssohn family. We know that the correspondence has a, a two ways. Um, Louis' cor uh, letters uh, are at the GRI, Mendelssohn letters are uh, at the Kunstbibliothek. Our collection is organized in 11 series held in 43 boxes. The collection includes transcripts or originals of the correspondence between the two major actors, the couple, Erich and Louise, from 1910 to 1953. Um, they reflect Eric Mendelssohn's architectural aesthetic and his political development. 
Louise, you see the couple here in a very well-known photograph by Alfred Bernheim. I'll talk about him in a little while. Um, Louise was very concerned with the architectural interest of Erich and the social recognition that blossomed from his work at the time. She also was, as we know, a major force in the work of his, of her husband, but she was also a proper intellectual, uh, played the cello in a very professional way. She had a fairly regular quartet. We know that sometimes uh, Albert Einstein on violin was joining the quartet. She was very much interested in fashion, in the art, in literature. So she is a proper intellectual herself. The papers also include Louise travel diaries, diverse sets of manuscript of her still unpublished autobiography. This is a work of all, our, of all of us that we probably need to undertake very soon, an annotated publish of this auto autobiography, the biograph biographical notes on her husband, sketchbooks, you see he here one, photograph of the family life, a small set, as I said, of architectural drawing, audio tapes of lectures, and a few plans of Irish students during his time of teaching. Subject and contributors represent a unique spectrum of European intelligentsia and beyond, and epitomize the dialogue on architectural modernism Eric engaged with his peers, from the avant-garde, including Feininger, Kandinsky, and Lisiski, to design colleagues such as Corbu, Gropius, Neutra, Weidefeld, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright, and architectural historians and critics, including Mumford, Pesner, Posner, and Zevi, to mention a few. And I leave Rogero on one side because it is an interesting case. The sketches I have presented so far, they come from a notebook, the one you see here, EM, 1987-1937, in which the architect follows the most significant steps of 50 years of his life and career. In this very unusual sketchbook, you see, for instance, here a, an, an image, the date is today, eh? March 21st. 1887, same year of Corbus, uh, Le Corbusier birth, and some major, um, his education, and then the countries of his nomadic life. So you see a very, very interesting way of capturing his own life. And then on the other side, the very rapid departure, 1933, going towards England. Well, we know that Esther had already left, but this is the idea of the family moving from uh, Germany. And another image here shows on one side, Eric Mendelssohn in the garden of his house in Berlin. Please note the flowers. Yesterday, both uh, Regina and Ita showed told us how much flowers were important in his imagery of the landscape. And then uh, the two poles, so this is a very, I found it fascinating little sketch of his early work outside Germany, England and Palestine. The man, I mean, with this two leg in these two countries. Um, another sketchbook that I recently, oh, sorry, um, found in the sorry in the archive uh, as woof is not dated but it's quite interesting it's a this page is a comment on Palestine at the very end it's written a happy time until 1939 and very 
In, together with this sketch, the same box has these photos that, of course, are related to Palestine. And it's Mendelssohn, Salman Schoken, and at the far end, I mean, it's Hans Schiller. We have to say a few things about those um, people, not, of course, Eric, not even Schoken in this kind, but I'm very interested for our collection in Hans Schiller and also the photographer, Alfred Bernheim. Um, he was an, a rather renowned photographer, started practicing in Dusseldorf before relocating the business in Berlin. He had received several commission to photograph also Mendelssohn buildings, but in 1934, Following Hitler's rise to power, the Bernheims, the family, immigrated to Palestine, where, as active Zionists, they were, they had visited often. And in Jerusalem, Alfred's daughter, Charlotte or Lotte, uh, married Hans Schiller, whom she had met earlier in Berlin. Hans Schiller was born in Breslau in 1917, much younger than, than Mendelssohn. In 1934, he also emigrated to Palestine due to concern over his involvement in Polish resistance activities. He began his collaboration with Mendelssohn in 1938, and under Mendelssohn's mentorship, he became certified in 1940 as an architect by the British Mandate government. When the Mendelssohn moved to San Francisco, the Schiller fo followed shortly and settled in Mill Valley. Hans also resumed his collaboration with Erich and uh, worked on all Mendelssohn US projects. The same sketchbook has also up oh, these beautiful drawings of the Golden Gate Bridge and celebrating Mendelssohn enjoyment, 1947, of living in San Francisco. The firm Eric Mendelssohn Architect was established in 47. In that year, Mendelssohn became an American citizen and received the license to practice architecture in California. This is essential for our archive. In addition, in addition to Mendelssohn as principal, the firm staffed was staffed by Hans Schiller, now we know, who had previously worked with him in Palestine, and someone called Michael Gallis. Um, the office closed, I mean, was completely disbanded uh, upon Mendelssohn's death in uh, early there, in 53. What you see here, it's a, an important and magical moment for the GRI. Those are, this is, those are two slides of the presentation in our special collection reading room of the donation, so the purchase as a donation of Hans Schiller collection in nine, 2018. It was a very important mod, moment to receive all the selection of original drawings, you see two images and also some unusual ephemera. So here I go very quickly and showing you some of the Hans Schiller, I mean, the drawings and sketches in Hans Schiller collection. And I don't comment on that. You recognize the drawings of the synagogues. I mean, many of them. We have seen some of the model yesterday, models in the Kunstbibliothek collection. Here you see the Russell House in San Francisco, other sketches, a very, what I found unusual, ephemera. This is a Steven Swide book of 1922, and inside the cover, there are four sketches for the uh, Schocken in Stuttgart, marked with the date 1928. So, you know, he's sketching everywhere. For him, architecture is the sketching. Architecture is the sketching. Then 
the other important aspect, and I don't go very late, uh, is the Federico Rogero uh, uh, correspondence, and then for the book, I mean, il contributo di Mendelssohn all'evoluzione dell'architettura moderna, Regina Mo mentioned this in 52, but while we had the whole correspondence, and the, what you see is the very first letter, 48, dear sir, I am a young architect, and he continues, amen. That's the beginning. What we received from uh, Peter Schiller as a donation, it's this incredible, basic layout made personally by Mendelssohn, sketching all the images for each page and even offering uh, notice of the literature, where to find the images, and so on. It's in a certain way what I would say it's an Eric autobiography in a certain way. And this is an incredible document. I go very quickly about this, but you will recognize also Mendelssohn's way of sketching. And he covers his whole life, the German, uh, some buildings, uh, I mean, of his early life, UK in this case, Jerusalem, of course, the Weizmann Institute, and then Progetti Americani, the American project. It's, in my opinion, an incredible document of his uh, uh, concern about how to leave the legacy of his work in the hands of the young Italian Rogero. The last, this is Maimonides, and yesterday we saw the beautiful models. It was touching. The last protagonist in this uh, collection is Michael Gellis. Uh, Michael Gellis' collection arrived through a dealer in um, Los Angeles and was basically related to Eric Mendelssohn's sketches for the, of the Atomic Research Building in uh, Berkeley uh, University. It's a building that has been, it's a project that has been built, completed by Michael Grellis after um, Mendelssohn's uh, death. And there are quite interesting uh, documents, uh, basically um, uh, sketches, uh, perspectival studies, and a final conceptual drawings. Uh, the drawings are traced in pencil and colored graphite on transparent paper and display really the Mendelssohn characteristic graphic style. I don't go very, I mean, long about uh, Michael Gellis. I want to say that he's the third uh, Jewish emigre in his office because Gellis was Misha Alexander Aimovich. Bo birth in the Manchurian Russia at the time, in a place called Mokden, or now Shenyang in China, and he moved to the United States, changed his name, Michael Gellis. He says it was too difficult to have a Russian and a Jewish name experience because of the many prejudices in the 20s and 30s. Um, he worked very close to Erich, and uh, they also shared some moment of very strong con a contrast. And to conclude the family stories, and as documented by the GRI archive and the role of the collaborator, I include two images, sorry you don't read the name, that I received from Gerald Davis. Davis was a Jewish-British architect who introduced to Mendelssohn via Hermann Schocken, who was Zalman brother and lived in Seattle. Um, his daughters contact me and send several projects, family photograph, and unpublished biography. Here you see Mendelssohn family, or again flowers all around in their residence in San Francisco, and to conclude, a trio, including Michael Hunter, 
Hans Schiller, and again, Louise, preparing the book of sketches, I guess, on Mendelssohn, probably a year after his death, so probably 54. So the archive at the GRI, it's really a combination of work and life of different actors. And the fact of those actors, I mean, overlapping their activities, I guess that makes the archive an important component for our UNESCO nomination in terms of supporting the research. Thank you for the attention. Do you wish us to sit here for the... Yeah, better. I mean, if we want to talk, it's better when we sit here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be in the in the center, but I'll sit on the side. <laughs> That's the time for questions, but I would like to, to thank you uh, very much, pro uh, Professor. Um, well, with such a richness of letters and sketches, uh, we are quite, we may be quite close to uh, what Eric Mendelssohn wanted to say the world through architectural uh, language, let, let the communication way. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank you all the speakers for informative presentations, very important to start discussion. Uh, uh, on positioning Eric Mendelssohn and the built heritage of the 20th century. So Mendelssohn system into World Heritage System. Uh, the floor is for, uh, for your questions. If you have, we also have participants online and I hope there are some questions uh, on the chat uh, sent to, to us. But we start with, uh, with you here. Uh, Regina, you would like to uh, take the floor, but I have a kind uh, request. Could you um, introduce yourself? Uh, I know that uh, some are well known, okay. but others are not. We, are, we also have people on, okay. online. My name is Regina Stefan, and I have got uh, some information about the the um, sketchbooks you showed, Marie Stella, I think that they were not drawn by Mendelssohn and not written by Mendelssohn. They are a gift of the daughter and the mother, or the wife, to Mendelssohn. The first one is the one from 1937, I think. It was for the 50th birthday. Yes. And it was kind of like a summary of their life until then. And when you look at the, um, the writing, it is, it is not his handwriting. Okay. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it is, it, I'm sure it's not Mendelssohn. I'm not sure we should have, I, I need to see the whole book uh, if uh, Esther was uh, part of it. The second one was from 1948, so for his 60th birthday. And this is an eloge to Mendelssohn by his wife Louise. And uh, you can see it on the handwriting and also the drawings, I'm pretty sure, are from Louise because also Louise was very good uh, in, in drawing. She made all the family uh, drawings and there is also a postcard. You know the postcard where they put the a windmill. She puts the windmill on a boat tra uh, traveling to the United States. And this is also um, a, a, a gift for Eric by Louise. So it's it's... It's another uh, universe that is opened uh, because she gives um, an insight in the family life and in their feelings uh, concerning all those different uh, places where they, uh, where they moved to, where they commuted between. I think this is important to know. Um, I don't know if I have to respond. Regina, the, the, this is very relevant because, you know, what we know, I mean, of course, the, the Mendelssohn scholars know everything about Erich <laughs> and good for them. The known Mendelssohn scholars, but the archivists or the curators, they look at the material and the material looks fascinated. And I have to say, it's important also to improve our cataloging. So it will be, for me, very relevant going back to say, 
Hold on one second. This is in this situation. I noticed that was the 50th anniversary. And, but it's also, re, it remains, in my opinion, extremely inspiring. I mean, you know, maybe it has a childish approach, I mean, to the life, but it's also part of our collection. The collection of the GRI coming from Esther, it's very, very family, the family. Yeah. And to understand the family of someone who moved around the world and uh, apparently needs to find roots, it's extremely, I mean, important. The same way as the, uh, uh, the text, the autobiographical text of Louise, I mean, yeah. Yeah, in the first sketchbook of 1937, there is a sketch that I published uh, with a swastika and, and yes. the, the idea yes, where to go to and so on. And it's puts and muts. <laughs> it was de dedicated to puts and muts, so I, I think it might be even Esther's. So the 1937, we have to prove it, but it's okay. definitely not Eric. Thank you very much. No, no. Hello. Um, just to add what Regina brought up, I think um, the Berlin uh, Mendelssohn archive should also stress a bit more Louise and the family which is already apparent in the Getty archive, in, in Louise and Eric Mendelssohn papers. But I think in, in Berlin, there should also be uh, more focus on the whole family and also especially on Louise Mendelssohn, which I'm still missing a little bit. And of course, there could be a cooperation for the autobiography of Louise, but it's a different perspective which brings in uh, all the more private aspects of the life. And if we are concentrating here also on the narrative of uh, exile, it's the family's uh, move. So this is one thing. Another thing I wanted to ask the ECOMOS, our ECOMOS uh, speakers, I have a specific question. I understood that it's very difficult to to bring Mendelssohn's or to fulfill the, all the criteria, but there is one thing which is not uh, clear to me. How about the support of the owners, of the actual owners of um, the buildings? If they have to um, say yes to the inscription. I mean, I'm thinking especially of the Ruppenhorn house. I'm, it wasn't brought up, at least I didn't hear it. So this is my question. Uh, thank you very much for the question. May I direct it to Birgitta? Would you, Ringbeck, would you like to answer? Yes, please, please come to the podium. I'm here. Sit next to us. Come to us. Come to us. <laughs> Yes, you have to uh, organize the consent of, the, uh, of all the stakeholders, and that means without the consent to, of, of an of a owner to inscribe a building on the world, in the World Heritage List, you will not make it. And again, so I, I just heard the discussions uh, on the... Um, significance of the archives uh, and materials uh, stored there. I think no, I'd like to underline again, the World Heritage is a site-based convention. And that means that all the values must be um, manifested with, with the buildings. So if you are discussing uh, Erich Mendelssohn and, and the exile, you have to make clear how transport a building this idea. Otherwise, you have to go for the memory of the world program. And I think that uh, that is a difficulty and that is a challenge and you have to fulfill this challenge. Yes. 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 The answer must be very clear. Yes, the owners, they have to agree on that because 
generally speaking, we could divide the preparation process into two parts. One part could be prepared by the experts from outside. It, it is complicated, but on the other hand, relatively easy because we are talking about the preparation of the papers, of the documents. So always we are able to prepare the documents. And the second element of the preparation process is the preparation of the management system which is existing in the field. So I couldn't imagine the situation that the proper management process, which is nowadays very, very checked formally by the World Heritage Com Committee in that long-standing process, would be created without participation and without agreement of the owners. So that answer must be positive, and I can say even further, if any elements of the potential nomination, we don't receive the agreement of the owners, such element should be excluded due to practical reasons, due to the requirements <laughs> of the World Heritage System. So the answer is yes, must be. Could you speak a bit louder, please? I, yeah, just try. So the operational uh, guidelines for the implementation of the World Heritage Convention uh, were revised last year. And that means you have, there are some crucial changes in the nomination process. The first change is that we have up from, yeah, with, with the year 2027, you have to go to a two-phased nomination process. The first phase, the so-called preliminary assessment, will, um, be, will, will in the focus of this first phase will be uh, the potential to, to um, convey the OUB of the site. And this phase ended, will end with a recommendation by, by ECOMOS International. If the recommendation of uh, ECOMOS International is negative, the state parties have the right, however, to go on and to, to go through the second uh, phase that is the uh, crucial phase. And in the end, you know, it is, uh, uh, it is up to, to the committee members and the state parties to, uh, within the committee um, to decide on, on the inscription or not. It is not up to uh, ECOMOS International. And the other thing is um, you have to organize community involvement during the process. That is a new item in the operational guidelines and you have to fulfill how is the community how was and is the community involved in the process? And that means not only the scientific community, you have to organize the involvement of the communities on the local level. So that I think is, you have to consider that, how to, to organize that. And uh, you, you asked uh, for, uh, it, it, it is a consent of the owners needed and uh, Boguslav again uh, underlined is yes, without the consent you will, you, it will not be possible to bring forward such a nomination. And a second, I think that is, is quite important to underline at this point as well, uh, you have the consent of the state parties. If the state party, and because the World Heritage Convention is driven by the state parties and you need the consent of your national governments as well. So without the consent, you, you as, as an association or an initiative, you cannot sub submit a nomination dossier to the World Heritage. You have to, to go through the official channels and that means via the competent authorities responsible for World Heritage nom nomination within your countries. Very much. Are there any more questions, Professor Haspel? Yeah. May I ask, because uh, now we have this wonderful panel where all uh, elements of World Heritage thinking or of World Heritage programs are assembled. And so I, I ask myself, knowing that there are different programs and different structures and different operational guidelines, of course, but is there an idea 
to share the vision which was presented by Moritz Wollen, who said, let's bring it together. That is what we tried. We tried to bring together documentary heritage, different heritage of life and of art and of designs and of sketches with letters and so on, with the built heritage, because we know that is one undivisible heritage, and separate heritage. So the question is, is there any idea to to find a roof which is beyond the different programs. That is the one. And the other, maybe I can, can continue and ask Moritz Wollen, when, when we see that, there, that the complexity of the task is very difficult, and it was mentioned that there must be something like a manageability. You have to manage the whole. So the question is, should we think about uh, a division of responsibilities and of work, but to think it together, to combine it, to keep it together, but not dividing it in different programs, but cooperating and using the platform or the, the, the programs of UNESCO for an advantage. And I realized that, for example, the, the State Library of Berlin, they are represented in the world uh, in the memory of the world program with, uh, with um, uh, Beethoven's, uh, with the Ninth Symphony and, and so, things like this. And the art library is not or not yet. Are you interested in uh, benefiting or in using this platform also for the collection of the art library, for example? That's the second question. But the first one is, is it possible to think more integrative and more uh, comprehensive than dividing it in the different programs. Okay, the answer is quite easy. In short, movable heritage is not an uh, is not. Uh, it is not possible to inscribe movable heritage as archives uh, on the world heritage list. So you, if you like to combine it, you have to uh, use criterion six, the intangible heritage, but you will never get inscribed the archive material on the world heritage list. You will only uh, get uh, the archive material in a certain way uh, recognized as very important for, for the material substance which which will which could be only inscribed in the World Heritage List. So sorry. May I add a, the, the question uh, because I, I think it's important because our our motive to, to come together and to assembly here was to think more integrative. And so you, for example, we know Auschwitz is the German Nazi concentration camp in Poland. And it is combined to the diary of uh, Anne Frank, which is memory of the world program. And it is combined with the process of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a unity. Of course, I see this are different segments, but this can also be looked upon as different components which belong together and which could support each other. We have uh, Niemeyer's Brasilia, Pampulia on the World Heritage List. We have the archive of uh, Niemeyer on the memory of the World Program. And so I'm thinking about when we discuss the eminent position of the work and life of Erich Mendelssohn that we should think it uh, together. That is why I insist on asking uh, if is there a, a, a possibility to combine it and not to deal it in, in fragments as we are used to it. Uh, thank you. I will use my position to also to add some <laughs> points. Uh, I think it's important to combine. I don't know whether the World Heritage uh, Program as such, I mean, the World Heritage Convention, um, uh, well, we'll gather all together, but first, the uh, information, all the archives we have are the source of information, and that's our primary source. And that's very important. And uh, if uh, this information are kept, also the immovables are kept in a place where they belong to, it adds into the integrity of the component parts of the building or w whatever is part of the uh, inscription. 
There is also a question of integrity, wh whether all the information, all, all the element, all the uh, 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 carriers of the value are within the boundaries we propose. So some of the archives which are beyond the buildings which are somehow uh, uh, designed by Mendelssohn won't be probably able to be part of the uh, of the nomination, I mean the, the inscription, but they can support uh, with information of uh, of the of the of the nomination itself. And uh, speaking about the a kind of co cooperation uh, between the World Heritage Convention and the um, uh, Memory of the World uh, uh, program, uh, the other example is uh, the case of Warsaw, for example. Uh, to some extent, it can be comparable because the uh, archives of the special unit who was organized to reconstruct Warsaw uh, on the Memory of the World program. And without that, we wouldn't understand uh, what happened during the reconstruction of the of the uh, historic center of Warsaw? So they can't be. I mean, they are um, uh, separated, treated, but they work together uh, in the process of the understanding and protection of uh, of world heritage. Um, so that's my addition to what was said, Professor. You would like to Yeah. Again. Again, the answer on your two questions, uh, Professor Haspel, would be very clear. No, there is not methodology or there is no pattern to obey all these elements, the complexity of the Mendelssohn legacy, which we observe, for example, during that discussion. Because the complexity of the heritage is growing so rapidly, that the methodology of analysis of the World Heritage Sites is not developing so quickly. So again, I would like to underline, we don't have methodology to combine all these elements. Uh, we, could, um, we could treat that, that legacy in a simple way according to what just Brita said, that on the World Heritage List, according to the Convention 1972, we inscribed only materially immovable objects. So this is the very simple uh, attitude. So the goal is now to produce any new totally pattern to have umbrella for all these elements and in practice to reduce them to the form which would be acceptable according to the current understanding of the World Heritage Committee. Because, you know, we face the problem that we are too close to the heritage. We are too close in terms of times, in terms of details we have at our disposals. When we are speaking about the um, pyramids, we know almost nothing. We, we cope only with the physically existent fabric. In that case, this is a almost living heritage, almost living heritage. Yeah. And therefore, it is so complicated to create a nomination according to the foundation rules of the conventions. So again, the first element is to, to define OUV and then try to organize everything. And in practice, reduce those elements because we have to remember that the analysis and the evaluation conducted by the World Heritage Committee, this is the not positive, this is the negative process. They are not searching for the arguments supporting why to inscribe. They are rather searching for the arguments why not, not to inscribe. inscribe. You have to understand that being organizer of that of that so we we should reduce all the elements which are weak in that nomination not because we think that they are great it is not important we should follow a very and create a very strict and simple line which would be understandable because here we gathered as a group of people from one cultural very small circle we have to understand that we will face 
colleagues coming around the world. And that nomination should be convincing for, for them, not for us, because we are already convinced about that. So again, to reduce, to be simple, and to exclude all elements which are weak in that nomination. Formally, formally, because informally, informally, we could add everything. Thank you, Professor. We, we have to finish, I mean, to stop our discussion for a moment, but I will take two more questions from, from the... Yes? Okay. Professor, well, restart. Yeah, so we take that. And then... It hmm? works, it works. Just it works? Yes, it does. Fine. Okay. Um, so, I understand that by definition, movable objects like archive material cannot be integrated into such a World Heritage proposal. So it's not, it's not an integral part of the proposal, but it must be an integral part of the process. Of the yes. Um, and um, I also got the impression this morning that there's a lot of knowledge and that there are lost a lot of primary sources spread over different um, countries and institutions, and that we have to bring these knowledge and primary sources together to be successful with such a World Heritage Proposal. So we cannot avoid, avoid the archives anyway, I think. Archives material is really important for the justification, but... Well, I mean, I, I want to add to what you presented, the system of the Kunstbibliothek. Um, from the very beginning, uh, Professor York uh, came with this idea of the memory of the world uh, program that Katrina, you also mentioned. I think that at this point, at, at least for the two institutions where the archives are held, I mean, the, the deposit, I mean, they should start a strong collaboration that goes on parallel with the work of the nomination. Because, the, as you say, in principle, everything is to be simple, but we need to build our strength. And one of the strengths can be also the, the parallel uh, work for the world, uh, the memory of world. Yeah. So that's something else. And we know that there are good sources at this point. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And may I ask? Yes, <laughs> a very short question and I hope short answer. Uh, it's for the first two speakers, Bogoslav and Brigitte, regarding the, what will be in the future, how, how to manage a multinational uh, World Heritage yeah. Site, you mentioned a uh, kind of a mechanism which uh, together uh, manage a site like that, five, six countries in our case, um, maybe more in the Le Corbusier. What does it mean? A little bit ask it for the UNESCO Israeli Commission because we don't have experience with this kind of management and it sounds very complicated and politically problematic can be. I think it, it sounds more complicated than it is, but I think you have you, you have to. This this is an initiative. That is my understanding, a first initiative. But you need a structure, and this structure. It is not possible that you, you base this structure only on scientific interest. I think you have a clear understanding. You have to, to involve uh, the level of the state parties. So that's from normally, it is represented by the focal points um, up to, to the World Heritage Convention. For instance, in, in, in Germany, it's the World Heritage Coordinating Body in the Federal Foreign Office because they have to know what is going on. And they have to inform the, in a certain way the political level. And in the end, all of the participating state parties, they have to submit a tentative submission format. And that is my recommendation always. I would, I recommend to start with a tentative submission format. It's three pages, not more. 
And then you can, can in the last part of this tentative submission format is how do you like to organize your cooperation on the different levels, on the level of the, uh, on the local or regional level where the um, um, monuments which should be uh, inscribed allocated it, then you have a level, I don't know, you have, of course, a scientific level, you need a writing, Normal, normally is you have someone who's, uh, whose task is to organize a process, and then you have, uh, a, for, for instance, a writing group. That means those people uh, who are writing, who are really doing, who, who are uh, preparing the file, and that I, therefore I, I put on 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 one of my slides a structure for for the la of, or for one of our last uh, nominations, uh, serial international nominations. Of, that was a structure for for the great path. I think you have a, you have to look on it and then see okay what kind of structure um, involving all the stakeholders is fit for us. I think that maybe the first one is the ECOMOST level. My impression is that the, uh, the national committees of ECOMOST are very much involved in this nomination process. And I think then we have a certain um, institutional group that are the archives and the uh, libraries, maybe uh, some some uh, institutes of of uh, universities as well. They are doing the scientific research and all the issues, which is quite important. And then I think you need in the end. Uh, and that is my experience. I, I uh, have the, had the privilege uh, of attending all the international CL nominations since 2004 in my official position. And uh, I think to, at, to, at a certain time you need the po political support as well because um, um, Ambassador Warps will <laughs> Know that in the end, it it is. Uh, it, I think you you have to find the way not only in the international research community. In the end, you have to find you have to find the way to the institutional organizations as well. Because of without, for instance, all the it, it, it was really not easy to put um, some of our international sites on the list. And in the end, for instance. Um, I, I mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, this site was inscribed without the consent of Ecomos International. It, it was in in the end, it was it was a political decision. Um, Le Corbusier was agreed, but I think therefore you you need you need to to um, it is nice to have a research group, but in the end you need you have to organize the political. Uh, support as well. Uh, I, I think these are very important questions and very important answers. Professor Schmegin wanted to add one sentence or two or it's three. <laughs> but in practice, this is not so complicated. There are two levels of management. There are two levels of management of the sites. One level that would be international level. And this, the second level that would be internal level. And in practice, the only applicable level, this is the state level. So in practice, for the management of each particular site is responsible state party and the manager according to their abilities and standards of the particular country. Additionally, you should create a system of the common management means in practice to create a council which organizes meetings, exchange, so it is something artificial in practice. So as a matter of fact, you should deliver the proofs of the management on, on the site level. The only, the only important point is to show that you organize that international level, you should, you should have time to organize the commission, to organize one, two, three meetings together, 
once in that spot than to move to the other. So to, 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 to show that you organize that international level of management, you need at least two years of time to be, uh, you know, convincing. But this is not a problem. Th thank you very much. I think we should stop at this point and have a break, take a break for lunch. We are staying here together and there will be many opportunities to continue the discussion on very important issues like the management protection and the concept. Thank you very much and applause for our speakers. <laughs> thank you.